Well, I'll stand. Okay. Okay, we're going to start up again. A little bit ahead of schedule, but I'd like to have as much time for discussion as possible. We're missing Isabella. She hasn't disappeared entirely, I hope, but uh, <laughs> not likely. I think she went to reinforce herself with some vodka. Well, that's not the way she does it usually. That's not the way. <laughs> Guy Laran. He will talk yeah, at the other end and then we'll go to discussion. Okay, there she is. Well, I have the great pleasure um, to welcome back the panelists from the first panel, but in particular to welcome Ambassador Richard Parker, um, who will serve as a commentator uh, on this panel. He'll be followed by Guy Laron. Um, again, biographies for both uh, are in, uh, uh, are, are available outside. Um, uh, do let me uh, advertise in, uh, uh, that Guy is the author of um, a quip working paper, Cutting the Gordian Knot, the post-World War II Egyptian quest for arms and the 1955 Czechoslovak arms deal. It's available outside and on our website as well. With that, let me turn it over to Ambassador Parker um, for his comments. What do I do when this laptop is up here? I just leave it there? Okay, first of all, I want to know, is a fox bat a real animal? Is there such a thing as a fox bat? Has anyone here ever seen one? Hold your hand up if you have. What's that? It is in the National Geographic? Okay, well, I have never seen one. But if you look up fox bat on Google, there's a very interesting set of uh, pictures of the air aircraft and discussion of its capabilities, which were extreme. Um, I'm a little picture man. I have trouble seeing, as Sam Lewis out there will know, I have trouble seeing the big picture sometimes. Uh, for me, history is a result of irrational events. Uh, incompetence rather than malevolence is a ruling factor. Uh, the Israeli attack on the morning of June 5th, for instance, succeeded so successfully because the, UA, the UAR Air Force was all on the ground and their anti-aircraft defenses were all shut down. This was because Marshal Amr, the commander of the army, was scheduling an inspection trip of uh, installations in Sinai for that day. And they didn't want, he didn't want to get shot down by his own people. Uh, had, the, had the UAR aircraft been up, as they should have been, I think the outcome would have been different. The Israelis would still have won, but uh, the, the defeat would not have been nearly as crushing. Um, I would say, like, also like to say with, with reference to Yakov Roy's uh, uh, remarks about the Soviets and the Egyptians, there wasn't anything inferior about the Soviet military equipment given to Egypt. There were specific items, I'm sure, 
that the Israelis thought were inferior to their own, but in general, it was good stuff. And there wasn't anything really wrong with the, the Soviet military training. Uh, in, in, in Soviet doctrine uh, probably was not as fully adopted as adapted as one would like for warfare and for desert warfare, but uh, 1983, uh, 1973, the October War, showed that uh, the Egyptians, with proper leadership, uh, could put up a very good fight. The problem with Egypt, the Egyptian army, Syrian army, all Arab armies, has always been one of leadership. Uh, except for the Jordanian army, the leadership has been poor. Uh, Amr had appointed his favorites to key jobs in the military establishment in the Sinai, and they were incompetent and unable to cope with the emergency <laughs> that began with the Israeli attack. It's interesting that Nasser himself did not know the state of the army. He did not know what, uh, what had happened. He didn't know that, they were that, uh, that Amr, on the second day, had ordered a complete <coughs> retreat uh, every, a rapid retreat, an immediate retreat. Uh, if he had opted to stay in the passes, the Sinai passes, as Nasser thought he thought the plan called for him to do, uh, the outcome again would have been different. Um, so, so Amr had paid for this afterwards. They, 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 he committed suicide. The Egyptians say, in Taharu. They suicided him. I mean, um, okay. I'm not a Soviet expert, although looking around this room, I bet I had, I had contacts with the Soviet army before anybody else in this room did. 1945. Can anybody else beat 1945? You're too young. You can't do it. Okay. Well. All right, except for this fellow. I had no, uh, <coughs> I had no claim to expertise, and I'm not really, I've read the book, the Fox Vat book, and I can't, uh, uh, it's, it's a hard read. Uh, there's a lot of material in there. They've done a lot of work. Uh, I can't really evaluate it. Uh, some Soviet expert will have to do that. Uh, what, what the Soviets are saying, how, how real it is. Um, one thing that impresses me, this was supposed to have been a, 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 a cabal between the, the Soviets and the Egyptians, but there isn't much <coughs> evidence of Soviet participation in it. Uh, it's all, this, I mean, I'm sorry, of Egyptian participation in it. The Egyptians are missing from this account. Um, <coughs> it was clear to me, it clearly was at the time, that the Egyptians were implementing a contingency plan. Uh, Amr wanted to get rid of UNEF. He had for some time. And this was seen as an opportunity. What he thought we were going to accomplish with this, I don't know. But the, the Egyptians were full of confidence uh, that uh, they were going to uh, uh, wipe out much of Israel. Uh, a, in a, a Lebanese journalist came to me one day in my office in Cairo. I was, a, I was the political counselor of the embassy there. And she said, the only question is at what point you were going to stop, you were going to intervene to stop the march on Tel Aviv. And we once, we noted this confidence, uh, Egyptian confidence. We uh, sent a telegram. Says this, 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 it's rather strange, we've been wondering they're acting as though they had a secret weapon. Well, this was just after the CIA had just given this, this final scrub to President Johnson, saying that it was clear that uh, if, the, if the Egypt Arabs started fighting first, it'd go on longer, but the Israelis would win sooner or later. So we immediately got a telegram back from Washington. It says, secret weapon? What secret weapon? But of course there was none. Uh, but you wouldn't, you couldn't tell the Egyptians that. Uh, they thought they thought they had it. They, they had Israel on the ropes. Um, uh, 
On page 30 of uh, her book, Isabella Ginor says, Parker didn't have any, the, the subject of Israel's nuclear capability did not come up at all in Parker's discussions with the Egyptians. Well, one reason I'm sure it didn't come up was because we had, on order from Washington, assured everybody that the Russians had no, uh, that the Israelis had no plutonium separation facilities at Dimona and were not on the route to making a bomb. Now, this is the result of two visits by these, this distinguished panel of scientists who went out there and had the wool pulled over their eyes by the Israelis. The Israelis lied to us about it, and we didn't know it. Um, it's a uh, it's, it's one of one of one of two major lies told us by the Israelis. The other was Abba Iban's claim that the Egyptians had started the fighting, not not Israel. Um, anyway, the Arabs uh, I think took us uh, our, our assurances rather seriously. Uh, the, but the, I'm confused about the f the two planes flying over D uh, Dimona because Marshal Amr took credit for that. Uh, on one occasion, and uh, in the events leading up to the war. And I assume he's talking about Egyptian planes, uh, n not Soviet. I mean, where is there, was there, were there overflights by the Soviets? There were two overflights. Were they both by Soviets, or one by Soviets, or one by Egyptians? Uh, I don't know. Is Avner Cohen in the audience? Yeah. yeah. Huh? Where are you? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, well, maybe he'll speak about that. Uh, Well, I can't read my writing. I wrote down something down here. Oh, yeah, no, I've, I've, I've said that already. Okay, well, all I say is that on uh, well, the question of the Soviet warning, which started the conflict, as one of the Rostow brothers said to the Egyptian, to the uh, Russian ambassador, you've just thrown a match into the, into the haystack. And it went right up. Nobody I know of in the area in the spring of 1967 expected a war. There was tension on the border with Syria, but there, there was always tension on the border with Syria. And we didn't really expect it, any, any kind of war. Um, it, was a, it was a big surprise to us, and I think to everybody else. The, the question was, we, I mean, we assumed immediately that the Russians had, conf, uh, had confected this report because we knew it wasn't true. Now, why did they do it? I went out to Egypt a few years later, and I went around asking people, why do you think the Soviets lied to you? Foreign minister and various people in the foreign ministry, uh, Vice President Zakari Mohideen and so forth, why did they lie to you? Well, they, they all responded, we don't think they lied. We think they believed the report. Uh, if so, where did it come from? And now there were some, some, there's some reference to Israeli troop movements, small troop movements in the area. Uh, this could have started something. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the, the funny thing is that the chief of staff went up from Cairo to Syria, uh, General Fauzi, and, and drove over the border area and came back and said, there are no troop concentrations. And this was dismissed. They didn't, the Egyptians paid no attention to it which means to me that at least Marshal Amr was going to push this thing no matter what. Was he in on the report? Is he at the source of it? One of the, one of the Egyptian generals who was in Sinai said the source of this was the, the Soviet military attaché in Beirut. Well, I can tell you as an old Near East hand, I believe that immediately. Uh, that's it, he's, he's hanging out in the bar of the San George Hotel uh, and somebody fed him this, and he reported it to Moscow, and then they were off to the races. Uh, I, I think, and I can't prove it, that the Soviets got a hold of some bad intelligence and didn't analyze it properly and went with it when they should not have done so. Uh, because, again, I think this was a question of incompetence rather than of serious intent 
to start a war. Uh, but uh, I, I defer to the Soviet experts in the audience for confirmation or denial. Okay, I, I quit. <laughs> Thank you, um, certainly for staying within the time limit, and I hope you'll, uh, 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 there'll be opportunity to, to um, speak later. Now we'll go from uh, uh, Ambassador Parker, who was there um, at the time, uh, to uh, the youngest participant on the panel, who wasn't even alive, <laughs> but who, uh, uh, that's right, who wasn't even born then, but has done a terrific amount of research in uh, the archives and is uh, giving us a a uh, brief comment with uh, highlighting some of his uh, his own findings. Guy, you've got Thank the floor. You. I hope this works. Okay. I want to start by thanking the organizers of the seminar for the opportunity to speak here today. I want to respond to the excellent papers we have heard by discussing a few key documents from Egyptian and Czech archives. By doing so, I will address uh, the question of Soviet and Egyptian intentions before the war, as well as the reasons for the Arab army's defeat and the ways in which the Soviet bloc sought to use the results of the crisis for its own advantage. One week before the war, Egyptian Minister of War Shams Badran and Soviet Premier Alexei Kosygin met in Moscow on the 26th and the 27th of May. Luckily for us, the full transcripts of the conversation as recorded by the Egyptian side were published recently. Some researchers claim that this was the meeting in which Badran coordinating, coordinated the looming attack against Israel with the Soviet Union. At least in his conversations with Kosygin, he did no such thing. Badran told Kosygin at least five times during the conversation that Egypt had no intention of attacking Israel and that Egypt would fight Israel only if it attacked Egypt first. We want nothing more, said Badran, than what we've achieved so far. The unity of the Arab world behind our leadership, control of Sharm el-Sheikh, and the presence of our army in the Sinai. In that sense, Kasigin's advice given during the, this uh, conversation to Badran to quit while Egypt was ahead was akin to preaching to the convinced. Badran presented the very position at the beginning of the conversation, even before Kasigin presented his. Of course, Kosygin encouraged Egypt in that conversation to stay in Sharm el-Sheikh. Egypt said Kosygin needs nothing more than what it already gained from the crisis. Now was the time he advised Badran to consolidate your gains by putting forward a proposal that would deal with means to end the crisis peacefully. Otherwise, warned Kosygin, you would leave the field open to Israeli provocations. During their conversation, Badran asked for arms supplies. He said that due to the Egyptian army's full mobilization, the army's depots were empty. Kosygin told Badran that even if the Soviet Union would decide to give these weapons to Egypt, it expected Egypt not to use them to instigate war. Badran reacted by saying that on the contrary, only if Egypt projected an image of overwhelming force would it be able to deter Israel and the U.S. from attacking it. Kosygin agreed with that assessment. The impression that Egypt at that stage of the crisis was willing to consolidate its gains and avoid a war with Israel conforms to two other messages that Nasser sent to the American administration, one of which was delivered by Robert B. Anderson, President Johnson's personal envoy to Nasser. The impression that the Soviet Union, while pleased by the achievements of its Egyptian ally, preached caution to its Arab clients during the crisis conforms with Nasser's and Yusuf Zouane's Syrian prime minister at the time, accusations made after the war to Czechoslovak officials that had the Arabs not listened to Soviet advices not to attack first, they would have ended the war in an improved position. Still, what about the fact that while in Moscow at the end of May, Badran met with Marshal Gretschko, Minister of Defense, who famously promised Nasser that if America entered the war, the Soviets would fight with the Egyptians on the same side. 
However, shortly afterwards, Gretschko told the Egyptian ambassador, Murad Ghalib, that he hoped Badran did not make too much of what he said, as this was only, quote, one for the road, unquote, or in other words, this was merely a pep talk. In addition, uh, the transcripts of the conversation between Badran and uh, Kusigin um, have a small uh, um, appendix, and that's a report by the same Murad Ghaleb, the Egyptian ambassador to Moscow, about a conversation he had on 27 May with Grechko. In that conversation, met, uh, Grechko uh, asked uh, uh, Murad Ghaleb whether the issue of a visit by the Syrian president, uh, Nur al-Din Atassi, uh, was brought up in the conversation, and Ghaleb affirmed that it was. Well, Gretschko said, we don't have time for this because uh, me and Brezhnev and Kusigin, we are going for a tour that has military aspects and Podgorny is going to a visit in uh, Afghanistan. Now, my question is, of course, if Gretschko is aware at, at the time that the Soviet fleet is in the Middle East and armed with nuclear uh, weapons and he's uh, coordinating a war with Syria and Egypt, how come he doesn't welcome uh, the coming of Atassi to Moscow at the time. But that's just a question, not an answer. Soviet and Czechoslovak uh, reports described considerable military inaptitude on the side of their Arab allies during the war. Of course, they had a reason to underline that fact as they were worried that the results of the war would reflect badly on the reputation of the Soviet weaponry. Indeed, one of the Czechoslovak's main concerns, even during the war itself, was that the Egyptians would shut down the military technical academy that they had been operating in Cairo since 1958 as a retribution for the poor performance of Soviet and Czechoslovak trained units. S still, it seems that Arab armies were seriously lacking in morale, discipline, and military tactical knowledge. According to what Soviet advisors based in the Syrian army reported to Czechoslovak officials, so unprepared was the Syrian Air Force for its confrontation with Israel that on the 7th of April, in an incident that is now regarded by scholars as one of the events that precipitated the crisis, the, the six Syrian MiGs that were hurriedly dispatched into the air to confront intruding Israeli planes were equipped with only training missiles made of wood. That did not help them much in the air fight that ensued, and these six MiGs were shut down. During the war itself, the Syrian Air Force did not perform better. According to one Soviet advisor, in a specific Syrian airfield during the war, there were 20 planes on the ground ready to take off. Yet the uh, Soviet advisor had to threaten the Syrian commander with his fist in order to make him give pilots the order to take off and chase Israeli planes. According to the Soviet advisors, the main reasons for the Syrian defeat were, one, zero intelligence on the Israeli army, and two, an inability to communicate properly with the troops. The case of Kunetra was brought as an example. In Kunetra, the Soviet advisors claimed uh, the Syrian army was well placed to defend uh, the city successfully. However, <coughs> a few Israeli tanks were able to appear behind the first Syrian line of defense. At that point, someone, no one knew who, phoned headquarters and informed them that Kunetra was lost. So headquarters in Damascus phoned the uh, commanding uh, general and told him to retreat. Well, the commanding general who knew the situation on the ground said he doesn't want to retreat. He was, a f uh, he was going to fight and fight a good fight. So uh, uh, they just repeated uh, their order and told him that he should uh, save his forces for more winnable battles. And so Kunetra was lost without a battle at all. In addition, told the Soviet advisors, for some reason, most of the elite tank units were ordered not to engage in combat activity. As Egyptian military blunders are better known, I will not elaborate on them here. Both the Soviets and the Czechoslovaks took pain, pains to explain to Egyptian and Syrian officials that the reason for their defeat was not the Soviet training, but rather the lack of it. Consequently, Soviet and Czechoslovak presence within the Syrian and Egyptian armies must grow. 
Grechko, in a conversation he con conducted with Amin Hawedi, the newly appointed Egyptian Minister of War, which took place at the end of October 1967, told him that Soviet advisors must be present within the lower levels of command and not just the senior ones. Grechko claimed, claimed that armies of Warsaw Pact members went through a similar process. First, there was a Soviet advisor in each of the command levels. Then, when these armies had improved, most of the Soviet advisors left and the rest stayed only within the senior levels of command. He also urged Hawedi to send more pilots for training in the Soviet Union. Likewise, General Miroslav Smoldash, special assistant to the Ch Czechoslovak chief of staff, explained to General Muhammad Fauzi, Egyptian chief of staff, at the end of June 1967, that the main problem during the war was the lack of technical and tactical knowledge by the Egyptian troops, and that therefore Egyptians must allow the Czechoslovaks to send additional experts to Egypt who would help to train them properly. Another person who was willing to use the Egyptian defeat was Yuri Andropov, head of the KGB. In a conversation with Hawedi, who was also Minister of Intelligence, which took pl place again in Moscow at the end of October 1967, Andropov said that some of the reasons for the results of the June war <coughs> was the lack of cooperation between their two respective intelligence services. That should change, he told Hawedi. Hawedi agreed with him. Then Andropov informed Hawedi that the KGB recently discovered that the Americans were able to read Egyptian encrypted messages and speculated that the Americans must have passed whatever information they have learned to the Israelis. Sakharovsky, head of the International Department of the KGB, who also took part in that meeting, told Hawedi that the Soviets could help the Egyptians fix that problem. Andropov said he was also interested in exchanging intelligence about Israel and conducting joint operations against American officials in Egypt or other countries. Hawedi said he would be most happy to strengthen cooperation regarding both Israel and encryption and said the Egyptian intelligence could be most helpful in conducting operations in Egypt and Africa. Hawedi was not the only one who was willing to agree to Soviet requests for greater cooperation. Czechoslovak officials who visited Cairo at the end of June reported that there was an ongoing purge of senior officers. Those who left were replaced mainly with officers who were trained either in Czechoslovakia or the Soviet Union. Indeed, they reported that the new commander of the Egyptian Air Force, Marshal Eza, was able to converse in Russian and had replaced the picture of Marshal Amr, which was hanged in the office during the time of his predecessor, with the picture of Marshal Vereshinin, head of the Soviet Air Force. Moreover, not only did the Egyptians not want to close the Czechoslovak-run Military Technical Academy in Cairo, but they also asked to enlarge it by adding a department for tactical studies, although in the past, that is before the war, they, they refused Czechoslovak requests to do so. In conclusion, it seems that Soviets and Egyptians did not want the May-June crisis to end in a war. Rather, they were hoping that the crisis would end peacefully. Both sides thought that Egyptian military presence in the Sinai should be maintained. When that plan was thwar thwarted by Israeli surprise attack and the ensuing successful military campaign, the Soviets decided to use the situation in order to enlarge their presence within the Egyptian and the Syrian armies. It seems that this Soviet initiative was gladly accepted, both in Cairo and Damascus, as in both places there was a dire need of military aid. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guy. I think uh, these presentations uh, have really given us a broad spectrum of uh, perspectives on uh, the beginning of the war, in particular the Soviet role, um, spiked with uh, some new documents um, and, um, uh, and personal reminiscences. Um, I'd like to give uh, um, uh, the speakers, uh, the authors, uh, 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 opportunity to respond, um, but would also very much like to um, 
then get to uh, the Q&A and get uh, comments from the audience. Uh, do you immediately want to respond or should we take some we'll questions? Take the, take the questions first. Take the questions first? Okay, very good. Well, then the floor is open. If you could wait for the mic and please um, note your affiliation um, or uh, you know, ad identify yourself uh, prior to speaking. I would ask you also to be succinct. We have a, only a limited amount of time. Um, and I'd like to give as many people a chance as possible. Uh, questions? Comments? Yes. We'll start with this gentleman down here. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I do not happen to be uh, really an expert, a Soviet expert. Uh, uh, hold on. I, we need to make sure the mic is on. <clears throat> And I also um, have not read the books, unfortunately, but uh, I happen to participate in a war. Um, as a could, young could you speak into the mic? So I'm speaking. People hear me? Okay, thank you. I happen to participate in a war as a young lieutenant, and I'd like to uh, share some of my personal views um, about uh, the, uh, the beginning and the aftermath of the war. Um, before the war, the country was like a, a coiled spring ready for action. Uh, as you recall, President Johnson, uh, prior, to, prior to the war, uh, mentioned that uh, Israel will not be alone if he doesn't go it alone. Um, and despite his assuring comments, the leadership, Levi Shekol, Eshkol, and the military decided to embark on a pre preemptive action. It was mentioned here. On the breakfast on the morning of uh, July, June the 5th, uh, 309 out of 340 Egyptian uh, planes were destroyed on, on, on the ground. And as related to, uh, as mentioned earlier, the, the, the Egyptian planes were supplied by, by the Soviet Union. The jet fighter was the MiG, uh, dubbed by NATO, NATO farmer. If you, if you could uh, yeah. focus on your question or your very personal experience, okay. but oh, experience we can't, is, okay. we can't okay. give sort of a history. Okay, well, point. anyway, the, the, the MiG and the uh, Topolov-16 and uh, the Aleutian, and I'm facing them on the Israeli side, were the, the jet fighter, the, the Mirage, the Vautour, and the Nord, French-made, and so on. Um, as um, the, 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 tank, the tank corps uh, approached the Sinai in three columns, and on June the 8th reached the Suez Canal, I have some pictures, by the way, taken. I'll be glad to share them at the reception that I took from the Suez Canal and the, and the desert. Um, basically, the advantage, the two <coughs> main advantages Israeli had were, um, number one, they were familiar with the terrain and the fortification from the 56th War. Uh, Eleven years earlier, the commanders, Israel Tal and Av Avram Yofe, they, they, knew ter they knew the area very well. Secondly, as noted in the memoirs of Gamasi, uh, after the war, the Egyptian command gave conflicting orders to go back and forth, back and forth. I really need you to come to your question. Yeah, okay, right? all right. Well, anyway, the, in the aftermath of the war, um, uh, bitter fruit for winner and loser alike, Israel quadrupled in size, secure borders, Lebanon mountains, Sinai Desert served as a buffer, added two million people, became regional superpower. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Overblown confidence, euphoria, superiority of the Arabs led to 71 war of attrition, intelligence failure in 73, Yom Kippur War, and finally to 1979, Camp David Accord. I enjoy the presentation. I have no question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and I apologize for having to be brief. Okay. Um, my name's Howard Moreland. Uh, in your theory, what was the uh, scenario in which Israel would be disarmed of nuclear weapons. Uh, were, were the Soviets expecting, in your theory, were they expecting Egyptian army to capture Demona and then uh, disarm it? Or how was that supposed to work and why did it not work? Okay, thank you. If you could return the mic to my colleagues here. Would you prefer us to gather all the questions? Yes. No, and then go, answer, ahead. Go, or go, go ahead. Go and respond. Well, we think that uh, the proposed uh, action would be if Israel would be defeated and uh, there will be uh, some political interference and uh, management of the results, it would be, first of all, uh, demanded to go back to the partition uh, borders and uh, to demolish the Mona itself. If it won't be bombed uh, during the um, uh, war itself, 
because it was marked, and we, we have a map here in our book of the Egyptian map with the, the moon as the center, as a, as a target there. So this is what we envisage. But of course, look, we deal only with facts. We don't want to speculate what could be, uh, because uh, it's, it's still speculation. Thank you. Any other comments from the panelists on this? On this particular question, no. Yeah. Okay, then we'll go to next question. The gentleman over here to the to the right, and then we'll jump to the left side. I wanted to get this panel's reaction to present. If you news. could identify yourself. Yes, I'm Joel Wishingrad, senior correspondent of World Media Reports, WMR News. I wanted to get this panel's reaction to the modern news. I've just come from a State Department press briefing this afternoon, and it's 40 years after the impact of the Six Day War. And there were remarks about the buildup today of the Syrian army. And uh, it's almost like deja vu. You have uh, President Bush meeting Putin. And all eyes are on both uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, whereas before you were commenting, the eyes were on the Vietnam War. And of course, it's the Russians that helped build the reactor in uh, Iran and also their black uh, box commercial contracts. The Iranians apparently have built a torpedo factory with Russian help. So I wanted to know what the scenario was in comparison 40 years ago to what's occurring directly perhaps right now under our eyes. Thanks. Well, if I may say, somebody very clever said once that uh, the history of the historical event can be for the first time a tragedy, and for this, when it repeats itself, it's become a farce. So um, things do not repeat themselves just in the same uh, way. And uh, uh, maybe there is some deja vu element in, uh, in their uh, situation, but uh, we are dealing only with the event of 40 years ago. So I don't think that we are qualified to uh, to comment, uh, especially on the briefings that we didn't hear what was said there. Thank you, thank you, Isabella. I I, I do uh, I would like us to focus on uh, the events that the authors and panelists have talked and uh, written about. So um, yes, over here. Um, two brief. My name is Stephen Shore. Two very brief questions. First is what was behind the Egyptian decision? to close the straits, which were viewed at the time as the immediate cause of the Israeli preemption. And has your research covered any more information about the attack on the USS Liberty? We knew that would come sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take the liberty first. Um, OK, Bella, if you want. We don't attempt to answer the question why the Liberty was attacked. Um, and the chapter that we do have in the book <clears throat> on the Liberty incident is there because due to the many discussions and arguments and debates over the Liberty incident over the years, more has come to light about the Soviet aspect in connection with the Liberty incident than on anything else. Um, so that we know now we can state for certain, even though, as I said, it's still being sanitized in official documents, that the Liberty was in, sent into the Mediterranean primarily in order to uh, monitor Soviet communications. Um, could, you, could you just, for the non yes, oh, The USS Liberty was a United States intelligence uh, ship uh, that arrived off the Sinai coast on June 8th, and within a few hours uh, <clears throat> was attacked by Israeli aircraft and um, torpedo boats, uh, seriously damaged. There were quite a number of casualties, uh, and this has been a matter of some controversy to this day, um, mainly because the Liberty survivors, who are very embittered, uh, <clears throat> claim that Israel did this deliberately for various reasons they have proposed. Um, Israel has always claimed that it was done inadvertently and apologized, uh, paid uh, some compensations and so on, but the incident lives. And in fact, tomorrow there's the 40th anniversary reunion of the Liberty survivors, and I expect you'll read about that. Um, th these charges will be renewed. <clears throat> one of them, by the way, only one, um, agreed to meet us uh, to discuss the Soviet aspect of their mission 
And he is taking a copy of our book down to their reunion, and we are eagerly awaiting the responses. But uh, <clears throat> So the Liberty was obviously sent in primarily to monitor Soviet communications. We can only speculate whether it was the sudden appearance of this awesome new aircraft, which was unfamiliar to the West, that was one of the considerations behind this because it followed a few days the first overflight of Dimona. By the way, let me now just state in response to Ambassador Parker, yes, there were Egyptian planes in these flights too. We know this for sure because signals were picked up by the Israelis of at least one panicky Egyptian MiG-21 pilot landing in Bir Gafgafa after making one of these flights. But we know also from the later appearances of the MiG-25 uh, during and after the War of Attrition, <clears throat> that because of its vulnerability on takeoff at lower speeds and lower altitude, it was always escorted by MiG-21s. So that those MiG-21s could definitely have been Egyptian. In fact, one we know for sure was. So that could perhaps reconcile the, the, the versions. To get back to the liberty. <clears throat> we know also uh, that there were quite a number of Soviet ships in the immediate vicinity of the liberty. Um, the entire body of the Sixth Fleet has been withdrawn from the Eastern Mediterranean after uh, Nasser accused the Sixth Fleet aircraft of taking part in the Israeli initial attack. So there was no U.S. vessel within 400 miles of the Liberty. And the first vessel to arrive and propose supposedly assistance to the Liberty was a Soviet destroyer. Um, we know of several others that were in that immediate area, say within a radius of 50 miles. Um, <clears throat> Interestingly enough, um, one of the reasons that Israel is consistently given for the torpedo boats attack was that they picked up twice radar signals of a vessel um, s steaming at 30 knots, which immediately classified it as a hostile target, while the Liberty was capable of 17 knots. And um, the Americans then found it hard to accept such an error, and we find it unlikely that such an error could have been made, but we do advance for further investigation. We can't, we can't say that we have any hard evidence on this, whether this was a case of mistaken identity, and there even beckons the conspiracy theory that the Soviets were intentionally luring the Israelis to attack the liberty because we do know that the Soviets were aware of the liberty's presence in the Mediterranean from the moment it crossed the Straits of Gibraltar because the liberty reported encountering three Soviet vessels, two of which we have identified as the counterparts of the liberty, intelligence vessels also. Um, now, <clears throat> for all of this, we don't propose any theory of our own as to why Israel attacked the liberty, but the liberty incident illustrates for us the so the, 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 the massive presence of the Soviets in the area, the fact that the U.S. was very much aware of it and very much interested in it, and the fact also that the U.S. is completely blacking out this aspect of the situation to this very day. That's about what we can say about the liberty. Thank you, Gideon. Ambassador Parker? Uh, well, the answer was, was there anything new on the, on the liberty? I don't think there is. I haven't seen it. The, uh, the survivors are having a demonstration on Capitol Hill tomorrow, I believe. Uh, what I think they want is a congressional hearing. They contend that there has never been a proper investigation, by which they mean uh, a hearing in, a, in, a, on the, cap in the Capitol where a, a senator or a congressman is grilling people about what happened. But I don't, uh, I have not, uh, I'm not aware of any new, quote, new information. There was another question. Second question, right, your first question. Closing of the Tirana Straits. Closing of the Tirana Straits. Well, we have been uh, uh, present to a very interesting lecture a couple of weeks ago in Tel Aviv University, dealing with the problem of Israeli energy supplies. And uh, it uh, appears that uh, most, if not all, of the oil supply to Israel at the time was moving through the Tirana Straits uh, to Elat. So obviously, uh, if you cut such an important artery, energy artery, to the whole country, you are uh, um, nudging ink to act in, uh, in its uh, self-defense. And uh, that the close, uh, closure of the Tirana Straits have been declared as a casus belli by Abba Ibn, I think, about um, immediately in after 
uh, effect after the 56th uh, suicide campaign. So it uh, uh, can be said that it was a deliberate act, uh, also uh, um, uh, motivated by the desire to provoke Israel into an action. When Israel didn't react immediately to this action and just waited, decided to wait and uh, go on with uh, uh, this closure, then came Foxbat. Let me just add that the Americans put it to the Soviets several times. If your question is, did the Soviets put the Egyptians up to it? Um, no. This was put at the times in se on several occasions by Americans to various Soviet sources, and they never got a hard and fast answer on it. It was never hard and fast denied by the Soviets. Uh, we don't have documentary evidence to prove uh, directions from the Soviets to the Egyptians close the straits. But we believe in that, in the speech by Brezhnev on June 20th, when he said that we gave them the warning about the supposed the troop concentrations so that they should take the appropriate measures, we think we have pretty good evidence to show that this was one of the appropriate measures. Well, I think that we also should have taken into consideration that the Soviets would never, never confirm any step like a closure of uh, uh, Tirana Straits, because if uh, someone can clo uh, close the Straits uh, uh, to another party, the Tur uh, Turkey could do it uh, to the Soviets, closing the Turkish Straits. Mm -hmm. So this is a very touchy subject. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Parker? Well, I'm going to say that one, uh, an important factor in the Egyptian action was the criticism they were getting from the Jordanians, among others, for hiding behind UNIF, uh, that, they had, that they weren't really sincere in their uh, efforts to uh, support the cause of the Palestinians because they were letting Israel live uh, peacefully behind UNIF. Um, Marshal Amr had, uh, there's, a, there's a history of Marshal Amr wanting uh, to call for the withdrawal of UNIF and to close the Strait of Tehran. And their position was once they were there, once they had troops on the ground, they couldn't allow the Israelis to pass through freely. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Roy? I find it difficult to believe <coughs> excuse me, that the Soviets uh, were behind that because... Uh, <coughs> the Soviet ambassador was told by NASA that he had just announced the closure of the Straits and he immediately wrote back home that he had no prior knowledge of it. So I find that rather difficult to, even if we accept that Brezhnev's uh, speech uh, four weeks later was concocted uh, and cannot be believed uh, completely, I think uh, an announcement by, uh, not an announcement, a, a diplomatic report by the ambassador to Moscow that he'd just been informed and he hadn't known about it beforehand I think corroborates that uh, uh, position. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go to the gentleman down here. Yes, uh, Could you wait for the microphone, please, and identify yourself? Uh, Mr. Rem, as you mentioned... You could please uh, identify yourself. My name is Emil Simiu. I'm with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which has nothing to do with the 67 war. <laughs> Have uh, technology, I don't know about standards. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Rem, as you mentioned in passing, uh, that there was a secret agreement in 1962 between Romania and um, uh, the United States uh, that had some bearing on subsequent events. Would it be appropriate to ask uh, yes, for more details? By all, by all means. Uh, this is mentioned in a, in a book by... Uh, <coughs> Lawrence, Gardner. no, his first name, um, Gardner. Raymond, Gardner. Raymond Gardhoff, uh, who was an assistant uh, to Dean Rusk, uh, in his memoirs of uh, the Cold War, in his memoir, an assistant to Dean Rusk, uh, in his memoirs of the Cold War, he says that Rusk confided to him uh, that following the Cuban crisis, not during the Cuban crisis, following the Cuban crisis, Cornelio Manescu, the uh, Romanian foreign minister, concluded a secret agreement with Rusk, whereby if another such crisis erupts that threatens to turn into a nuclear exchange between the two superpowers, Romania is opting out and, so should, not be, and should not be targeted. This was published in the Cold War Project Bulletin some years ago. Yeah. Well. So uh, this, is, this is rather well known. 
we f- think uh, that uh, in following the events in the conference of uh, Warsaw Pact leaders uh, on June 10th, that uh, resulted 9th, 10th, that resulted in the severance of diplomatic relations uh, by all the Warsaw Pact members except Romania. Um, that the record there reflects um, that the Romanians at the last moment pulled out of uh, this uh, thing and in this activated this agreement. Um, by not severing relations, this was a signal to the United States that, okay, as we agreed, we're opting out. Um, <clears throat> the <clears throat> one reason we say this is in a previous case, for instance, when the Soviet Union severed diplomatic relations with Israel, um, Bulgaria took over as a protecting power um, because then it was decided that the situation did not warrant the entire Warsaw Pact uh, severing relations. In this case... Warsaw Pact did not yet exist. uh, Sorry, the the Eastern Bloc. You're right. Um, Now, uh, (coughs) in 67, um, as we found the evidence of, Finland was selected in advance uh, to be the protecting power before relations were, were severed. Oh, we, we didn't mention this time. There's a document, a very curious document, as Professor Ori has called it, um, in a, a collection of Soviet foreign ministry documents, which puts a cover letter on the Soviet protest of June the 5th, which was actually handed directly to Israel. There's a cover letter in this collection of documents uh, sending it supposedly to the Finnish embassy to transfer it to the Israelis as if relations had already been severed. And we think we prove in the book that this proves that the severance of diplomatic relations was prepared in advance and it was originally expected to occur on June 5th. Uh, but <clears throat> Finland was selected evidently because that was the closest nation that would uh, remain with diplomatic relations with Israel. If they had known in advance that Romania was not severing relations, it would probably have been Romania. So that um, <clears throat> we think that this uh, agreement was followed up on uh, in this crisis. <clears throat> I mean, uh, I mean, Garby Osgood Center, John Hopkins. I just want to ask, although it's a contrafactual history, uh, so wasn't it for those two reconnaissance flight, this war would have never broke broken out, or just there were too many subplots that this will happen sooner or later? Because it seems like from the, your whole book that this story particularly sort of upped the ante at some point that. This was inescapable. Thanks. Well, we know for sure. Uh, there's been a very, an excellent book published by Ami Gluska um, containing the records of the Israeli cabinet and general staff meetings, uh, which were given to him, although they remain classified. And some of it was censored, but much of it came out. Uh, and we know that, that these two overflights, particularly the second one, caused immense consternation. Now, whether... Uh, Israel, per- perhaps, let's say, had Israel not only suspected a grand Soviet design, which we know it did from the diplomatic uh, exchanges that went on, but also suspected that this design included drawing Israel into a first strike and therefore would have refrained from a first strike. That's already two counterfactual questions. Okay, uh, w- that's getting a bit complicated. Um, so we'd rather refrain from what would have happened. We know that this, these overflights definitely were a major factor, if not the major factor, in pushing first for the change of, uh, <coughs> of government in Israel and then for the decision to go to war, etc. That we can say for sure. What might have happened otherwise if they hadn't taken place is very hard to say. Thank you. I, I would really love to hear from Avner Cohen, who is uh, one of the foremost experts on um, uh, the nuclear, Israeli nuclear issue. Uh, at some point in the discussion, but let me uh, uh, turn all the way to the back, the microphone. Um, uh, Mr. Granville, all the way in the back, at the very, all the way in the back. Uh, Red Austin, two questions, if I may. <coughs> Excuse me, two questions, if I may. Granville the, Austin, yeah. Uh, Granville Austin. Austin. Yeah. Uh, two questions for the panel, if I may, and particularly for Ambassador Parker. One, there was some thinking at this time after Nehru, uh, Nehru Nasser had, had uh, closed the states of Tehran that his mouth simply may have run away with him. In other words, he was giving a speech, and in the speech was uh, all, in f- 
all about how we're going to win and the terrible Israelis and how grand we are. And the thought was that he was so entranced by his own hyperbole that he simply closed the straits and sort of woke up to the consequences of that somewhat later. The second question is, I thought from the material that I saw when I was in the department at the time, and this is relative to the Liberty, that the Israeli aircraft surveilled, if that's the right term, the Liberty for at least three hours. Yes. If that is true, and do you know what evidence there is for or against that, because I remember it as being true, um, it would be very difficult to, to misunderstand what the Liberty was if you're flying around looking at it for uh, three hours or more. Well, it wasn't the same plane. It was, there were a number of Israeli flights that passed over the Liberty. It wasn't the same plane circling the Liberty, but otherwise you're right. Um, again, it's not our purpose to explain the attack on the Liberty. We're using the Liberty incident as an illustration of the centrality of the Soviet element. Whether, say, one of the Israeli flights picked out a Soviet destroyer, radioed it, radioed it home, the, it was radioed back to the TBA boats, and they went out and struck the Liberty instead, for instance. These are all speculations we don't want to get into. You're absolutely right that the Liberty was under surveillance, and you're absolutely right that the Israelis have a lot to explain. Sorry. The, uh, the plane was, uh, was, was surveilled by the Israelis. They noted its, num its number. They identified it, and they had a... They had a a card on their plotting board at the headquarters at Haifa. I mean, this is the Israeli explanation. When uh, the, the, uh, during the lunch break, there was a change of shifts, and somebody removed this tag. And so then when this ship was reported later, they assumed that the Liberty had gone on. They had no idea it was still around. And uh, this was a, 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 actually a question of Israeli incompetence. That, that is why they uh, they missed it the second time. The first part of the question. Yeah. What was that? The question on the straits. I don't have any comment on that, uh, okay. except except uh, that, of course, he would have had a chance to back down. But uh, you could perhaps say that he wasn't suited in character to do that. Right. Well, um, the, one of the reasons I directed this to Ambassador Parker was because he was in Cairo, and A, he's a long-time fluent speaker of Arabic. Well, Nasser wasn't speaking to me. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, oh, come on. Yeah, well, he, he often, often I think he got, caught, he got carried away. Nasser was not at all, you know, we have an image here of somebody like Hitler. Uh, not at all. I used to listen to Hitler when I was in high school. Um, Nasser is speaking sort of as a, uh, the father of the family, a very quiet conversational voice with a sense of humor. And uh, sometimes if the audience like what he said, he'll get, he'll get carried away, like as speakers often do. But uh, I th think of the, pr the principal uh, reason we saw at this point, he didn't, uh, uh, as someone said, uh, Abba Iban had, had said, uh, declared when they uh, called for the withdrawal of UNIF that as long as they did not close the Strait of Tehran, there wouldn't be any war. Well, that would be sort of a challenge to Nasser. And he didn't, uh, he didn't think the uh, it, Israelis were as strong as they were. Uh, he thought that they, he could handle them. And he didn't, he didn't think a threat of war would be all that important at, th at this point. He had a very unreal uh, understanding of uh, the strength of Egypt and Israel. Thank you. Abner Cohen. Well, since uh, Christian asked me to say something, I, I was a little reluctant to, to say because first, I'm not Soviet expert, and I think the issue today is about Soviet intention interpretations, and I don't feel qualified to talk about that. I would say two things. I mean, one to begin with, I mean, 
there are two or two and a half incompatible versions of Soviet behavior on this table. It would be interesting, I think, for the benefits of all of us. I mean, there is the mainstream view, which I think has been strengthened and perhaps has been deepened by Yakovoy and by Guy. And there is unconventional view with some very intriguing material, which has been put here forward by Gidon and Isabella, friends of mine. It will be interesting to have direct dialogue. Obviously, I understand they're not compatible. They're not just two different interpretations, but they're incompatible. It will be interesting to have some discussion between these two things. That's one. About the Israeli nuclear program, I would say two or three things. One is, it is true that Israel was fast on technology, and by 65, 66, a great deal of the work to develop nuclear weapons has been already achieved. However, my personal view is that in 67, weeks or even days before the war started, Prime Minister Levish called politically was still undecided. There were, of course, events that took place that in many ways overwhelmed politics, technology in many, but it was because of the drama of the crisis. But there was gap between technology and politics. So the mysterious message, or whatever it was, between Sne, Chubachin, the Soviets, and Israel, is very mysterious because I think Prime Minister Eshkol at the time, for one thing, it would be sabotaging to give that kind of message to the Soviet. But for another thing, I don't think that he himself knows politically where he's going to be in two years. And it takes quite a while until that message has been translated, according to this version, into some actions. So there is something very strange about that. Yes, the world was full of rumors that Israel is about to develop, this was in the open literature, nuclear weapons. But this, I don't read it as a direct intelligence message. So I have major issue, and you know, I told uh, Isabella and Gidon, their friends, about my, my, my problem with, with, this, with this piece of evidence. The other thing is, one should be clear that there, what is presented here is a radical different interpretation of the behavior and conduct of the Soviets uh, in the context of the Cold War. I mean, this is a totally reckless behavior, if it's true. Uh, it could lead to a third world war. And one wonder, I mean, for one thing, where is some sort of deliberation? I mean, I think there is something here that leads us to conspiracy theory. And most academics, maybe they have bias against conspiracy theory. And one wonder, where is the evidence? I mean, I agree that a great deal sometimes is not being left on paper, and there is no paper trail. But when there is such a vast conspiracy theory, one wonder where is something? And so far, in terms of motivation, in terms of politics at the high level, they have very intriguing data at the mid-level, as good Gideon put it, perhaps tens or hundreds of elements in a puzzle of 10,000 of them, but we don't have anything at the top. And that's, and that's a problem. So that's my broad issues with, with, with this. Well, first of all, I have a question, Avner. Uh, do you have on the top level any document about Israeli nuclear program? Yes. You, you have? To some extent, and definitely I have some. Well, to some extent, we also have some documents, Soviet documents from the highest level, but on, also to the some extent. But if you excise uh, the Israeli nuclear problem from the documentary evidence uh, needed, you can excise anything else. This, this is the first point. And uh, the sec uh, second point, uh, well, now I think the second will take up the second point. About, about the, irris the irresponsibility of the Soviet action that we, uh, well, first of all, I'm delighted that, Yakov, and we can agree at least on the fact that the Soviet Union acted in 67 much less responsibly than we thought before. Okay, so much agreed. Now, the Soviet Union tried something similar in Cuba before, did something similar in Afghanistan afterwards, and did exactly the same in the Middle Eastern arena three years later. So direct military intervention risking a superpower clash. Okay, so what's the, why this astonishment? Uh, and uh, so that, I, I don't see, this problem I do not see. Now you're absolutely right that we have a problem here I'd say of, we're, we're trying to dig a tunnel, and we're starting out from two opposite ends, and we're not meeting in the middle. 
uh, Guy and Yaakov have the documents, and the example of the Badran talks is an excellent one. According to the documents that Guy has, and I'd be delighted to read them. In uh, Arabic. In a, well, whatever. <laughs> in, in, in your translation. translation. In your translation. Nothing happened there. Nothing happened. I mean, Badran came convinced, and for four days of deliberations, nothing happened. In this time, the second overflight of Dimona, be it Egyptian or Soviet, was undertaken, a grossly provocative act by any standards, when both of the parties there had agreed they weren't going to risk a war. Now we have the uh, testimonies of Soviet participants in these talks, which is exactly the opposite. Pavel Akopov, among others, who was later the number two man in the embassy in Egypt during the War of Attrition. So the Badran came with the maps, with a date line uh, uh, for the operation on the 26th, and, and three times pleaded for clearance to go ahead with the preemptive strike. And three times the Soviets prevailed on him not to do it, to wait, not to cancel it entirely. The, Conventional theory has been that the Soviets prevailed upon Nasser not to attack Israel at all. We think it was just to postpone it, and according to the, a recent Russian version that we've seen, it was indeed postponed till June 7th, not canceled entirely. So we have conflicting versions. We, so, but you're starting the tunnel from the top. We're starting from the bottom. Okay. And indeed, if any, not only all, if any of the indications that we have of Soviet actions that were not only planned, but activated, and in some cases actually implemented. We know of at least one marine landing that was actually done. Okay? We know of these MiG fly overflights over Israel, which were actually done. We have the evidence now, official confirmation from the, so from the Russian Air Force, plus the testimonies of the two pilots who actually did it. I don't think we can expect better than that. Now, somehow these tunnels don't meet. Now the question is, whom you believe more? When you have this minutes of discussions, in a, uh, for a later period, we have a case of the ex so-called expulsion of so-called Soviet advisors from Egypt in 72. Okay? We have first the memoirs of Kissinger, and then the records of the conversations between him and Gromyko over the years, which now became the, and they don't, first of all, they don't fit. But second, in one of the, in one of the climactic discussions of this issue, just uh, at the Moscow summit in 72, there's a very detailed uh, record of the conversation, which is very revealing in itself, and then the two ministers adjourn for a 20 minute tete a tete, no record, And it, just before that, the two say, and we, so we've reached an agreement which will include some oral understandings. No record of the oral understandings. So we say we're going to try and piece together the picture of what the Soviets actually did. And you piece of, the, the, of what the Soviets actually intended. And for, for the present, these two pictures don't match. And I think we're going to have to start, continue working to try and make those two tunnels meet somewhere. But for the time being, I agree, we have a problem. And yeah. Uh, yeah. So you either believe the evidence or you believe the documents. And uh, I tend to believe the evidence. <laughs> this is, this is, the discussion brings out some of uh, the issues. This is good. Uh, Yaakov, uh, uh, Guy, would you like to respond directly yes, to this? I'd just like yeah. to... Uh, Yaakov. I'd just like to address the question of uh, the second pilot. Um, first of all, he was in Egypt in 1970, yes. 1971, and when he was interviewed about his feats and uh, so on and so forth, he never mentioned the 1967 incident at all. He only talked about uh, 1970, 1971, so I doubt that uh, we can say that he took part in this one. Also, the announcement of the Russian Defense Ministry spokesman speaks of uh, the flight of a, 20, of a MiG-25 RB 
which did not yet exist in 1967. It only came into existence in 1970. There was first of an, an, an R and then a B, that is for reconnaissance and for bombing, and the same initials in Russian as in English, so it's okay to use R and B. And uh, they only combined the two in 1970. So again, I think that must have been a mistake of uh, the uh, Russian uh, Defense Ministry. I don't see how we can clear that up, but uh, the way I see it anyway, it is a mistake. I agree, that, but we do have the other uh, testimony, which uh, I, cannot, uh, I cannot discount. Thank you, Guy. Okay. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I want to counter the claim that academics don't love uh, conspiracy theories. I, for one, really love them. And uh, I, I became in love with the theory that w there was a struggle in the Kremlin between uh, Brezhnev and Kosygin on the one hand and Gretschko on the other. But I haven't seen anything in the material uh, that I saw that uh, uh, validates that. Uh, there's nothing that I've seen that uh, proves that uh, uh, Gretschko uh, was instigating a war uh, in the Middle East. What I find really surprising is that uh, there's nothing about it in the Czech material because Czechoslovakia was a, a, a major ally of the Soviet Union in the Middle East and uh, there's absolutely nothing about it. There were military missions, Czechoslovak military missions going around in the area in April and May nothing uh, about uh, uh, some sort of uh, a special uh, uh, Soviet presence uh, in the um, uh, Mediterranean. Um, there is also nothing about it in Arab sources. May I make a suggestion? I think in order to make it easier for our two tunnels to meet, let's stop treating the absence of evidence as proving anything. Okay? Let's just take positive evidence either documentary or factual, and as proving perhaps something. But the lack of evidence for something ha to have happened, let's, I, I suggest we clear that out. Uh, they, we've tried, at least in our research and book, to eliminate the suggestions uh, that we're, we're discounting this because nothing to this effect has ever been found. It may be found someday, maybe not. Let's try and concentrate on what we do have rather than what we haven't found. Thank you. Let's take a couple more questions. Um, on the right side, um, Alberto Tonini, over there. Thank you. My name is Alberto Tonini. I am from the University of Florence, Italy. If we assume that the Soviet plan was to neutralize or to destroy Israeli nuclear power, can we find any evidence of the Soviet intention after 67 to provide Egypt with any nuclear facilities in order to counterbalance Israeli nuclear capabilities? Okay, we'll take a couple more questions, give you a moment to think about it. The gentleman in the back there. <coughs> Mr. Bodansky, a few comments uh, running quickly. A, these were MiG-25, Israeli Air Force ran comparison of the flight profiles after the MiG-25s 20, were identified in, during the war of attrition. The profiles were identical. Number two, as far as the issues of GRU, the knowledge of the Russian embassies about, or Soviet embassies at the time about this and that, uh, Vinograd being surprised by the eviction of the uh, uh, advisors, etc. The real communication between the Soviet guys who were doing the job and the Kremlin or Moscow were done by the KGB and the GRU. The diplomats were kept in the dark intentionally so that they can lie and cheat for the country honorably without a blink of the eye. That happened in, during the Middle East, it happened in Afghanistan, happened in Korea, happened in Vietnam, happened in the Horn of Africa and all other parts of the Third World that the Soviets were involved in. They were always parallel. I've seen very, very few exceptions and that's, being, that's a practitioner's talking. Uh, as far as the Egyptian reports about meetings of one kind or another, 
I don't know, I've, I haven't seen the document that you talk about and so won't comment about them, but I've seen Egyptian reports about conversation about which I have intimate knowledge. They were lying to the teeth, they were reporting to the, to the masters what they thought the masters would like to hear as opposed to what was said or done in the room, so I'd be extremely careful about dealing with that. Uh, I think we'll two, have to. Two very brief. Number one, the Egyptian contingency plans that were supported, uh, developed uh, with the Soviet advisors were all offensive in nature. There were no defensive contingency plans. Israel captured a lot. The other collection of these contingency plans. So if the Egyptians were supposed, as you suggest, to just hold out to, the military would have been provided with continuously plans to hold the ground, defensive ones rather than offensive. Last, the GRU expected Israel to be destroyed at the end of the uh, Six-Day War. Uh, well before the war, these were the expectations of the study they've, they've done. Be very curious to see the, the evidence for that um, as well. Uh, we'll take a couple more, couple more questions uh, in the center here and then the gentleman Right to the next, and then we'll turn it over for a final round of comments by all of our panelists. This is a fascinating discussion, and I think that if you just look you at... You could Vlad please identify yourself. Uh, Vladi Rosenbaum. Uh, if you just look at the uh, June the 20th plenary meeting and the uh, record of it, which we really don't have in the original, there are copies in translations, and I had uh, looked at one of those uh, from Polish, and I noticed that there are some discrepancies from the interpretation that we had in the bulletin here a couple of years ago and the Polish version of it. So uh, that's one thing that, that we should look really uh, and find the original, the Russian original if we can. But there's also something else here, that there are reports about this meeting from various sources and one of them is Petro Shellist who was a Politburo member at the, Politburo member at the time and who published memoirs. Actually, I don't know how many copies. I suspect that nothing is available now because I found about him and the memoirs and particularly the issue that we're discussing here in the uh, Flot Ukraini, which is one of the papers that nobody reads, I guess, except the people who serve in the Navy, uh, Ukrainian Navy. So he specifically talks about the plenary meeting and the circumstances why uh, Yegorichev was removed from his position the same day. And what he proposed, he was the uh, member, uh, he was the uh, chief party chief in Moscow at that time. What he proposed was Ukraine. that, that Russia, uh, the Soviet Union should immediately launch an attack against Israel. And second, he also criticized severely the Soviet Defense Committee of which Brezhnev was a member. What happened, by the end of the meeting, he was no longer uh, of uh, chief of the Moscow party committee. He was immediately sent to a uh, minister's position of a ministry which was in a big, big trouble, agricultural machinery uh, <laughs> ministry, something like that, okay. and he disappeared. So, you know, and the other thing, just quickly, there are Polish sources also that you need to look at. Uh, there is a evidence from some Polish, high-level Polish diplomats who participated in some of those uh, talks, for example, at the June 10 uh, meeting in Moscow, the summit meeting. Uh, so they are very revealing as well. And I submitted some of those things actually to here. Well, we hope to be publishing some of these documents, including some of the ones that uh, the panelists have referred to in a future issue of the bulletin and also on our website. But now uh, to the gentleman. Yes, to um, Morris Wolf. I've been um, the legal counsel for the Wallenberg family, and uh, I've been boring into Russian diplomatic history from my own vantage point, and the whole idea of reliability of Russian official documents is deeply, deeply suspect. Even the report of Wallenberg's death, we now find out that the man who allegedly made the report had actually retired three or four months before someone signed his name to the re trumped up report suggesting Wallenberg's death in 47. So we see this whole concept of penaloka, which is let's fool the foreigner. And it shouldn't be any surprise. It's not boring two tunnels. Maybe it's more complex three. Uh, diplomats are trained 
at times to lie. Pearl Harbor, the Japanese diplomats were told to lie to Roosevelt and Hull about the plans. So it comes as no surprise that we as sophisticated uh, scholars and students uh, find this idea that reports are untrue. I mean, they're trained to be untrue, and I'm not casting any aspersions on any honorable member of any diplomatic corps at this time. It's just history, okay? So if we take reality as it is, we have to take a sophisticated approach that we're not going to look at documents and think their face value has value. We have to really look at the facts of what happened. So uh, with that comment, I'd just like to add a third tunnel that you can connect. Well, uh, if I may add, if you remember 62 at the height of the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, Leonid Zorin, the Soviet ambassador to UN, was saying that there are no Soviet missiles in Cuba, and at the time, the Khrushchev's open speech on the radio to Kennedy was broadcast uh, on the radio. So, uh, or uh, most of the Soviet diplomats of this level, of the um, uh, ambassadorial level, they were direct, directly uh, subordinated to the party, but not to the foreign ministry. They were reporting to Brezhnev or Khrushchev and giving the instructions, uh, receiving the instructions from Politburo and maybe sometimes through the, uh, through the foreign minister, but the instructions came from the Politburo. Thank you. I, I may just add that uh, you mentioned the Japanese in Pearl Harbor and so forth. It's not only the bad guys who do it. I'm not making any well, Okay. Uh, <laughs> Could you, would you like to respond to some of the other questions or comments we get? Um, I'll bet you Lini's to? question no, about. Okay. Um, I, I just yeah. wanted to respond to two questions by uh, Mr. Vodonsky. Okay. Uh, about uh, Egyptian lying uh, through their teeth. Uh, the document I, uh, I'm speaking about was published by uh, Amin Hawedi. Uh, it's the original transcript. You, you, you see the photocopy. So I don't think it's forgery. And, and in any sense, let's assume, and in any case, let's assume they were lying through their teeth and it was written to uh, 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 gratify or, or uh, it, it was written in order that some uh, uh, senior official would be pleased with the document. It only strengthened my point because if it was written in order to satisfy, I don't know who, uh, Nasser or Badran, how come uh, this, uh, the content of the conversation is so, uh, let's call it peacenik or peaceful. Uh, the other thing I wanted to uh, comment about was uh, whether the Egyptian army in, in Sinai had um, offensive or defensive uh, uh, structure. Um, I only invite you to read uh, an article by uh, Roland Pop that was published recently in the Middle East Journal. And according to um, uh, CIA secret estimations, it was a defensive structure. According to the CIA estimations, there were no nuclear weapons in the Middle East in 1967. Richard Helms reported this on May 24 in the Situation Room. So with due respect to the CIA, apparently their performance vis-a-vis -vis Iraq was not much of a change to what happened in 67. <coughs> Okay, any, any, other, any other comments? I would uh, just like to answer uh, Alberto Tonini about the continuation. Uh, we, I don't think, we don't think that the Soviet Union would provide nuclear weapons to any of its uh, Arab allies because uh, it doesn't look that it would be the Soviet policy to let um, uh, nuclear weapons out of its own hand. They made mistake one with China. They wouldn't like to make it again. But we had seen in some of the documents of uh, reports that the nuclear issue vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel has been mentioned uh, later on after the Sixth uh, Day War. First of all, in '68, the Soviet ambassador in London um, um, mentioned that uh, Soviet Union has been uh, uh, cannot forgive the Israel two major capital sins. One of it refusal to join the NPT, <coughs> and the second is uh, uh, Israeli threat to, bomb, uh, to take out the Aswan High Dam, uh, probably with the nuclear arms. Then on the height of the war of attrition, I just don't remember at the moment at what country, but two Soviet diplomats uh, have been uh, telling Isra an Israeli diplomat that uh, the next round of fighting will be done with the nuclear arms, implying that uh, the arms on the other side would be Soviet arms. 
I hope it answers at least partially your question. There were, we, we do know of some Egyptian feelers toward the Soviet Union. What a, every time that uh, the Israeli nuclear issue came to the fore in the media and elsewhere, about feeling, what, what would be your response if um, we requested countervailing nuclear weapons? And there, there were feelers from the Egyptians toward the Soviets at various stages from 1960 onwards about countervailing nuclear weapons <clears throat> if the Israelis obtained them. And uh, to the best of our knowledge, the response was always negative. I mean, uh, the, the Soviets did not make an exception for Egypt to the rule of not spreading nuclear weapons to any of their allies. Ambassador Parker would like to make some remarks and then also... Uh, well, I have to say that I made a serious effort uh, some years ago to write a book about what actually happened in 1967. I'm disappointed that it hasn't been pointed, passed out to you here so I could sign it, but it's like <laughs> Politics of Miscalculation in the Middle East, uh, University of uh, Indiana Press. Um, this is the first really serious attempt in particular to find out what the Soviets did. Indeed. Indeed, yes. Uh, there, is a, there are several black holes out here. One is in Cairo. Uh, we don't know very much about the in internal uh, dialogue in Egypt. Uh, Syria is uh, really a black hole. We don't know anything at all. There haven't been any memoirs. I tried to see the vice president of, of Syria some years ago and ask some questions, and he expressed total ignorance. If I just send him a letter and what my questions were, he'd let me know, and I immediately sent him a letter, and I never got an answer, of course. But it's a, it's a total black hole. We don't know anything about the Syrians. The Soviets, it seems to me, it was another uh, at least gray hole. We know something, but there are a lot of things we still need to know before we can reach any conclusions about what they were up to. Thank you. I uh, could not agree more. In some ways, this, uh, this, uh, these would be good concluding remarks. I should also add, I want to add, that Ambassador Parker um, not only published um, previously on this <laughs> subject, uh, but also <coughs> convened one of the really pioneering conferences on um, uh, the 67 war, bringing together various perspectives uh, some years ago. Um, but now, Jakob Roy. Perhaps, uh, Ambassador Parker's book will be the way our tunnels will meet, because Gidon and Isabella and I, we all agree that his book uh, is uh, important uh, evidence mm -hmm. from which we can start our research. Um, I think we have to be careful about the logo of uh, documents versus facts. Not because I think we should believe everything that is written in a document the same way as we don't believe everything that a politician says. We shouldn't believe everything that he writes. But at the same time, that is what we have to work with. So we c have to use the documents. I agree we have to check and counter-check as far as we can. We, we cannot not work with the documents. <coughs> it is impossible. Oh, definitely. I'm saying what we're say I'm saying is not to not work with the absence of documents. Once you have documents, they definitely have to be worked with. What you cannot deduct from is the absence of documents. Okay. And second, secondly and lastly, I just want to say that I have the Russian version of the Brezhnev speech, uh, and it will be published in translation in English in our book that uh, hopefully will come out in about six months' time. Oh, well. well then you have, you've sold a copy. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, now, before we go uh, and uh, continue this um, uh, discussion more informally over a glass of wine um, or soda, uh, I'd like to ask Jordan Baev just to briefly give us um, a notice of a um, new CD-ROM that has been published of uh, new uh, East Bloc evidence, in particular Bulgarian evidence on the Middle East. This will be just brief if technology the technology plays along. Jordan, could you come up, please? Um, and then uh, um, along with a, a round of applause for uh, our panelists with thanks for their stimulating um, uh, presentations. And uh, thanks to you for your contributions. We'll adjourn to the 
uh, boardroom across across the hall. So, will technology play along? No. I think we'll go down, down to the front row. Yeah. We won't get in anyone's way. <laughs> right behind us. Want to walk down and sit down there? So let's give, in the meantime, let's give the panelists a round of applause. There is, <laughs> there is no. Okay, why don't you start your comment? <laughs> uh, well, uh, uh, first of all, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like uh, to make a comment or introduction, intro introduction uh, in the title which uh, Christian Osterman uh, made for me, because uh, if we want to understand uh, more the East European position, we should know that uh, there is no unique monolith Eastern Europe. There are at least, in particular for the Middle East policy, two Eastern Europe's, Central Eastern Europe and South Eastern Europe, because uh, of many uh, roots and uh, different uh, historical reasons in southern eastern Europe, uh, uh, there were a lot of connections with this region in the for five, six centuries. Uh, first of all, because uh, uh, in the Ottoman Empire from Habsburg Empire to Egypt and Libya for five, six centuries lived together from Serbia and Bulgaria to Arabic countries, uh, this uh, people, and uh, it was multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multi-religious uh, community, so-called. For, for the first, uh, first uh, British expression of Near East was uh, included also Bulgaria and Serbia in 19th century. So first, uh, we had connection with this uh, region. The second uh, was the uh, different fate of uh, the Jewish population in Europe uh, because uh, in southeastern Europe the so-called Sephardist uh, Jews had another fate. They incorporated in our culture, in our societies, in our people and uh, perhaps uh, you know, uh, most of you know well that uh, the only people in the Second World War who save their own uh, uh, part of their societies. Uh, Jews uh, was Bulgaria. About 60,000 of Jews were saved. And I would like uh, here to uh, avail the opportunity to uh, give a present to our colleagues from Tel Aviv University a new book with about 2,000 documents about this process of Second World War. Well, the next uh, one uh, comment of mine uh, before to present you our new uh, um, uh, documentary uh, multimedia volume, which we uh, uh, published uh, a year ago with uh, contribution and with the support of uh, Woodrow Wilson Center of Cold War International History Project. Uh, this is uh, that uh, uh <coughs> Bulgaria, in particular, was uh, in after the Second World War, during the communist rule, uh, probably the most uh, uh, reliable satellite to Kremlin, to Moscow. That's why we can find now, currently, in our archives, a lot of documents regarding the Soviet position, the Soviet policy, and uh, some kind of testimonies of Khrush Khrushchev, Brezhnev, and other uh, uh, Soviet politicians and foreign ministers 
confidentially, uh, they spoke about their policy with uh, Zhivkov, with uh, other uh, Bulgarian uh, uh, politicians. And uh, we found uh, such uh, interesting uh, documents in uh, Zhivkov personal archives. Also, you can find now they are available a lot of documents in uh, Yugoslavian President Tito's uh, personal archives. They are available. Unfortunately, Ceausescu, uh, Romanian uh, communist ruler, uh, his personal records uh, were lost in 1990s somewhere after his uh, so-called trial. Nevertheless, uh, you can find also in uh, what we found in our uh, diplomatic intelligence and political archives a lot of uh, things regarding Romania and Romanian uh, particular position after 1967. So um, I just want to show you uh, here in our well in the in the last couple of years, uh, uh, in cooperation with Cold War uh, History Project, we published a uh, few volumes of uh, new available Bulgarian uh, dip, uh, documents, of uh, Cold War documents. Uh, this was first of uh, uh, Zhivkov personal records. There are some uh, uh, notes, some uh, uh, protocols of his uh, meetings with Arabic uh, leaders. The next one was Bulgarian secret services during the Cold War years. A lot of interesting uh, things regarding the cooperation between KGB and Bulgarian state security in this period. And this was, you can see here in English and Bulgarian by, le let me, where is, Okay. So uh, here you can find about uh, 250 new documents, uh, which part of them uh, we requested to be declassified uh, last year. In particular, I, I would like to stress your attention on cables that came from Bulgarian embassies in Tel Aviv, Cairo, Damascus, and uh, Baghdad, and uh, these other uh, different uh, capitals. And uh, inside, uh, there are some interesting uh, things also uh, about uh, the policy, about the um, personality of some Arab leaders, Arabic leaders. It was very interesting. Uh, uh, confidential uh, portrait that uh, Zhivkov himself uh, made of Gamal Abdel Nasser, and uh, another information regarding the uh, rivalry and tension between Marshal Amer and uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser on the eve of uh, the Six Days War. And also, uh, what I uh, should, ma uh, should say, uh, it was interesting, the diplomatic history of the um, so-called, uh, the corridor history uh, in the United Nations, because in 1966-67, Bulgaria was a non-permanent uh, uh, member of uh, Security Council, uh, United Nations Security Council, and it was uh, uh, total uh, subordination to Kremlin's uh, intentions in this period. You can find inside uh, uh, this documentary volume uh, a lot of uh, evidences, even uh, how uh, it was created, uh, the resolution 242 in October 1967. Also, there are some protocols of uh, uh, on 5th of uh, June 1967, uh, Bulgarian leader Zhivkov made a visit, it was uh, in advance, a prepared visit to Belgrade. And exactly on uh, 5th and 6th and in June, uh, he talked a lot with uh, Josip Broz Tito 
a friend of Nasser who received direct information from uh, Cairo. So you can find uh, such kind of uh, information regarding the Yugoslav position, Bulgarian position, and also about uh, information about uh, uh, 9th and 10th of June um, consultations or uh, discussion in Moscow of uh, July uh, 1967 discussion also in uh, Moscow, then another discussion in, Var uh, in Warsaw. So uh, from this part of uh, documents, uh, uh, researchers and who is uh, interested to uh, receive more information from the East European uh, point of view about uh, the Six Day War and the consequences of Six Day War, you can find uh, uh, a lot of new pieces of information and also of uh, our Ministry of Defense and Intelligence Services uh, um, conclusions of the consequences of the Six Day War. They were, uh, 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 of course, confidential, secret uh, documents. Uh, they are very critical about the uh, Arabic uh, uh, art of war in this period. So I, I, I can say that uh, this is just introduction, intro introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bayev. I'd like to invite... <laughs> By the way, if you're interested in the CD-ROM, uh, contact him at the reception. Um, there's also information on our website about it. Uh, thank you again for joining us this afternoon. Thanks again to our presenters, Gideon, Isabella, Guy, uh, Ambassador Parker, and Yaakov Roy. Please join us for a reception in the boardroom. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Roy. I want to present him this book. He's, he's, he's going to be at the reception.